So we have 50 seconds to go on that. kind of match you. Mm -hmm. I mm. just decided I would do that rather than have things falling off my shoulder and crazy my ear. So I said, oh, oh, I got something that'll work. Uh, yeah, she's going to rehearse with me after. We did something before this week, so she's gonna, she wants to be ready for that. And she's under control. Welcome to Farlington United Methodist Church, whether in person or virtually today. 
Uh, we welcome everyone, and uh, that includes people who are visiting on our live stream, our visitors in the sanctuary, uh, old hands and members. My name is Janine. I am one of the clergy team here. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I uh, just want to give you a little bit of instruction for today. If you are a visitor, we have blue cards in the pews and you can register your attendance. And if you'd like to have contact from the staff or clergy team here, uh, you can indicate that on the card. Uh, there's also a place for you to include some prayer requests. And I'll say a little bit more about prayers later on in the service uh, to let you know how we use prayer requests here at the church. I want to also remind you that the ushers are here to help you out. If there's something you need, something you can't find, we want to provide good hospitality. And please ask one of the ushers. So if you need a large print hymnal or if there's uh, something, a little extra help you need, please see one of the folks out in the gathering space. This morning, we welcome the Reverend Drew Enns, who is the ministry director at RISE Campus Ministry at George Mason University. He will be bringing the message and he will also be with us after worship today. We hope that you either brought a bag lunch or just brought your interest. Uh, there are cold drinks. If you didn't bring anything else, you can have a cold drink. We're gonna have some conversation with Drew uh, about his ministry and about some things going on in his life currently. It is very important for you to know that his partner is Katie and they are the parents of Josiah, Benjamin, and Anna. And that was the, the important information he said you need to know about him. Uh, they are not with us today. Uh, it, it's difficult to, uh, to get a large family together and dealing with children in worship spaces with the pandemic is difficult. So maybe they will see him on the screen later so uh, he can wave to them and uh, say, hello and uh, include them in the worship service this morning. Thank you for being here. You're the reason that we lead worship, but we are worship together. So with that in mind, let us turn our hearts and minds fully to the worship of God.
Hello, my name is Jackie Weevil. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm the pastoral assistant here at Fairlington. I invite you today to please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship, which is found in your program, or if you are online, you can find it on our website as well. Come, be nourished by the words and witness of Jesus Christ. He came that we might know of God's absolute steadfast love for us. Receive the gift of bre the bread of life and hunger no more. We are grateful for Jesus Christ who has given to us this magnificent gift. Come, let us worship and rejoice. Let us sing our praises to God. Amen. May we be in a spirit of prayer. O oh, Holy One, you are the presence that gives us light from within, light that assists us in our understanding. So as the sacred texts are read, are heard, and are received, may that great light inform us in our thoughts and in our actions. Amen. <laughs> Needed to put the uh, little riser down because I'm short. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Beth Strausser, and uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I will be reading from the Hebrew Scripture, the first book of Kings, chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, and chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. 
Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted, Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare to you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. The word of God for God's people. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Jerry Rule. The second reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 51 through 58. Please stand as you are able for a reading of the Gospel. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat of the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died, but the one who eats his bread will live forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I will say that I know my family is watching via live stream, and we have a great family friend here today as well joining us, so it's good to see you, Aunt Liz. I wanted to go ahead and um, just kind of start with, I think what most people are feeling after they hear this reading is, wait, what? It is a weird passage. And as a parent of a toddler who's learning how to speak, I have to tell you of a wait, what moment that we just had. So my daughter is two years old, figuring out how to talk. She went through speech therapy. So the fact she's 
using full sentences now. We're very excited, but she still has a little bit of that uh, a lisp and a little bit of difficulty speaking. And one particular word uh, is very difficult for her, uh, the word frog. Now, I don't know about you all uh, who, who help lead, uh, teach school or especially preschool, but there are sometimes the kids come to say words and you know that that is a naughty word that they shouldn't be saying. And for me, uh, when we first heard our daughter say frog, it came off as something very different. <laughs> and we are glad we have three more weeks to try and fix that before school. Because frog is a word that you would use in a preschool, but the other word is not. But both my spouse and I, we were sitting there, we went, wait, what? And with two older brothers, there is that chance that maybe she's saying something she shouldn't be saying. But no, it is definitely frog. And I wonder, as the disciples are sitting around and as people who are following Jesus are sitting around, Jesus starts into this conversation and it sounds weird. Like I, I imagine just sitting around and being like, yeah, this is all good, bread of life. Yeah, I'm behind that. And then he starts talking about flesh and blood and eating and drinking and just, wait, what? But I think one of the things to really understand um, is that Jesus is speaking as someone who is trying to challenge his disciples. There is a literary and, and teaching technique that rabbis used, which was her hyperbole. And in this moment, Jesus is using hyperbole to talk about the ways in which you will fully be a part of who God wants us to be. Certainly, Jesus is not talking about cannibalism, which was one of the early criticisms of the church. People who are trying to persecute Christians would look at this passage and say, these people are weird. They would point to communion and say, what are they really doing? And it's very clear that the listeners, the Jewish people that were listening to Jesus speak, they literally said, wait, what? What are you asking us to do? And I think the problem that we find in the scriptures is that the people were unwilling to actually listen to what Jesus was saying. They were unwilling to listen to something new. They were unwilling to really take and make a part of them the teachings that Jesus was calling them to do. As it says a little bit later that they ended up leaving, a lot of the people that were following Jesus left because they were unwilling to listen. They were unwilling to be challenged and they were unwilling to say, you know what? We really need to live out what Jesus is telling us to do, not simply just nod our head and be spectators. After all, Jesus was the hot new prophet in town. It's exciting, drew large crowds, and yet here he was. And the problem that we found in the scripture is not unlike things that we have in our own world today, right? We live in a world where people have been taught that instant gratification is a good thing. It's not an ego thing per se, it's just something society has taught us. And we were always looking for the next hot new thing. But most people are unwilling to really internalize, really live out the thing that might take years and decades to live into. To really do the work of transformation. We want it to happen like this. But that's not the way that things that matter rarely go that way. Things that matter and make a difference in our world rarely happen overnight. They take years, decades, lifetimes to make happen. When something is new and something is scary, many people would prefer to just walk away. And in our society, I think there are many of us, myself included, that our times are scared to grow, scared to be wrong, to admit that I was wrong about previous presuppositions. Well, the good news for all of us today and in the scripture as well, is that wait what moments can also lead to great transformation. I love the story of Solomon and I imagine God sitting there asking Solomon, this young person, what is it that you want? And for Solomon to say, I wanna be wise. I wanna follow you. 
wonder if God went, wait, what? <laughs> That's not what I would have wished for if I was a young person. I'd be doing exactly, and God literally says, I thought you were going to say riches. I thought you were going to say honor. I thought you were going to say prestige. I thought it was going to be all these different things. But to be wise, to live out life, it's amazing. Jesus promises to the disciples in this passage that, yes, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be a part of you. These teachings that you internalize, I'm going to be there. And that's one of the beautiful things about communion is that we believe that Jesus is truly present. Not that it's his flesh and blood, but that Jesus is here with us when we're able to worship together, when we're able to take Eucharist together, when we're able to be with one another. This morning at the communion service, it was wonderful to be with a group of people taking communion, feeling God's presence, feeling Jesus in the midst of that. But friends, Jesus is calling his disciples to remember something really important as well. Jesus sits and says, you know the manna from heaven that your, that your ancestors used to eat, that gave them strength in the desert as they were wandering for 40 years. This is different. And I think what Jesus is really getting at here is that the disciples, some of them, they just wanted to survive. But Jesus had more. Jesus wanted them to thrive. It's not good enough to just eat to be able to survive, but to really live out, to really be transformed, to really believe in resurrection, not just after life is over, but a resurrection that happens here and now and daily to change, to be transformed, to make this world a better place to be more holy, to call society to be more holy, to call our beloved institutions like the United Methodist Church to do better is something that we are called to do and that Jesus promises to nourish us through. There's so many good experiences I've had recently too of, wait, what minute moments? I have to tell you that... Uh, one of the first things that came to mind was my engagement. When my partner decided to marry me, we were at the Lincoln Memorial and I asked and she didn't say anything, which was, by the way, if you're doing that, that's a bad sign. If you ask someone to marry you and they don't say anything, it's not good. Doesn't, doesn't leave like a good moment. Like, you're like, oh, cool, wait, what? And she literally said that. She said, what? Again, not what you want to hear right at first. Uh, luckily, she said yes. Lucky for me. I don't know if she would still say that. She's not here. Sometimes being mentored as well, asking people that you look up to, to be able to take some time with you, especially as a young pastor, um, can be a wait what moment that someone would actually take notice of you. And I'm going to tell you this right now that for our older members, I, oftentimes in college ministry, I hear younger people say the fact that someone would take time to care about me, to love me, to put aside their own preferences so that I might feel God's love is definitely a wait what moment. And I have to say too, getting cards and letters, particularly from members at Fairlington, with everything going on the past couple of years in my life and in my ministry is a wait what moment. I tell you those cards and letters have shown up at exactly the right moment. Friends, Jesus calls us in this passage to look at the world in a different way, to not just survive, to not just come and nod, but to really thrive, to make a difference in our world, to teach us, to grow with us. After all, we know later on in the gospel, according to John, that the spirit is inside of us and continues to teach us, continues to open the scriptures to us. And as I get ready next week to be able to work with our leadership team at George Mason University and Nova Community Colleges, one of the things that we've been talking about over and over again is that we need more people 
to really take to heart this idea that Jesus is within us. We need more people to really make the world go, wait, what? I thought I knew Christians, but you're different. I thought I, I've read in the newspapers and online and seen videos of what Christians look like. We need more wait what people to change the minds and hearts of individuals in our society, on our college campuses and in our communities. I pray every day that our campus ministry at Arise is that place. Too often I've sat with people in coffee shops and had people just say, I'm done with church. I've been thrown out. I'm unloved. Does that mean God no longer loves me? Until I found you all. It's a wait what moment. Being a reconciling church, changing the ways in which people look at the United Methodist Church and Christians as a whole. Fairlington, you are a wait what community as well. When we live out what God is calling us to do, when we say enough, when we put ourselves out there, we change hearts, we change minds, and most importantly, we allow people to experience God's love in a truer way. One of the things when I first came to Arise, we had to make the decision about our vision statement. And I was adamant that we would include Jesus in that vision statement. And there were some great reasons to, to take out Jesus, um, to just say that Arise was a place where all are welcomed, where we share God's universal love, and we can passionately live out our faith in the community and on campus. But I said, we need to put Jesus in there, that because we believe in Jesus, we do these things. Because the world needs to know that Jesus also would be present in reconciling communities and ministries like Arise and Farrington, that Jesus is calling us to something more, that Jesus is calling us to love God with everything we have and to love our neighbor, no matter what society would tell us or the differences, that we are to love one another. Living that out is a wait what moment that this world is desperate to know, to desperate to experience. And friends, let's do it. Amen?
As we pray this morning, uh, it occurs to me that worship is frequently far too wordy and perhaps to pay honor to the texts of the day, a text about wisdom and also a text that is about the very enfleshedness of God's grace, uh, that we might approach the prayers a little bit differently. So I'm going to invite you into a time of prayer that will uh, perhaps be unusual for congregational prayer, maybe is a little bit more contemplative, but also maybe helps us to experience prayer with our whole bodies. So may we be in a spirit of prayer. Oh God, allow us to visualize the color of your formative work in our lives. Today we're surrounded by rainbow patterns, expressions of your great creation. Let that inform our inner minds of how good and giving you are as we pause now to visualize how grace is at work moving with and through all of us and all of creation. Great and good listener, teach us how to listen with our hearts. Help us to experience now that still small voice that is within each of us and that many of us do not attend to, that gives us guidance and encouragement and hope. Let us practice that in these moments. Spirit God, help us to imagine that brush of wind, the warmth of your love, and the breath that fills us and promises to fill us even beyond this life. Help us to touch that, to feel it, to experience it right now. and compassionate God. Help us to surround with our own love. Help us to surround with our own care. The places we now bring to mind, places of violence, of warfare, of natural disaster, 
places that are, are big and visual on the global scene, and also the small places, the hurts of our own families and of our own lives. Let us picture that tenderness that compassion finding its way into all of those spaces. And now, God, we have received prayer requests from this congregation. Those prayers which are shared within the life of the church throughout the week to come and that are shared with the congregation. We have lifted those dear ones in our prayers and we ask your healing blessing on each of their lives and situations. Fulfill their needs, grant them perseverance, and may they find the peace and rest they need in their path to wholeness. We now light this candle as a reminder of those people who have been named both in word and in spirit. May the light of love and hope fill their lives, just as this candle burns and flickers as a reminder of the light of Christ. May it also remind us of your abiding presence, even in our darkest hours. Thank you, God, for addressing all of our needs and cares and for allowing us to be ourselves before you. Thank you for honoring us and allow us to honor you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory
We now are at the time of the offering, which is another privilege we have as the church to do this strange thing that we do, uh, putting money into plates or baskets or presenting it in some way before God, trusting that it will be used well. As always, we are very encouraged by the generosity of the people connected to this congregation and for the many ways in which we're able to be in ministry. One of the ways that's uh, visible in some of the pews, and we're getting there with all of them, is we, we now have QR codes for giving. Uh, we also have a QR code for a first-time guest and also to download an app to your mobile device so that uh, you can engage with the church from your mobile device without having to go to the website. Uh, more features about that will be explained later. But I, I just do want to point this out. Jackie and the church staff have been working really hard on this so that we can move into the 21st century, finally. Please uh, uh, notice that we're putting out communications, helping people live into uh, the our, our new way of doing things. We need to say thank you to the people who have already shifted over uh, to the new giving modes. That is so helpful. It actually saves the church a little bit of money on processing. So we are exercising good stewardship by doing this. Please, please know that uh, part of what we can offer is support and we are happy to help people understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. So as we come to the time of offering, let us uh, give a prevenient prayer knowing that there is generosity here in our midst and knowing that our stewardship of these gifts will be informed by the wisdom of the leadership of this congregation. May we pray. Thank you for allowing us to bring our whole selves, O oh God. To you, our very presence in worship, in person or virtually, is a gift in itself. So we give thanks with all of our hearts, and we give thanks from the resources that we have been given responsibility for that your name may be lifted and your good work of love may be felt far and wide. All this we ask that it be so in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort. In trouble, he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my grief has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. For my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me 
Before I turn the microphone over to Drew to offer the dismissal with blessing, I want to thank everybody, but especially this morning for Sam and for Beth for the special music. And we're doing way too much of this. We're sending Sam off to his senior year at Elon. So it was, we caught him on his last Sunday here. So Sam, thanks for being with us. We, we thank everybody, definitely. And uh, for Bella, who had just finished her first year at Tech and who helped out uh, acolyting today, we sometimes don't lift up our acolytes enough for all the good work they do. So uh, now I'm gonna ask Drew if he will offer the dismissal. And when we finish that, you may go out for ice cream if you wish. Uh, but we are going to return and stay seated during the postlude. Let us go forth from this place, knowing that there's a world waiting expectantly for a group of people to love fiercely, to love boldly, to love in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us be those people. Amen. Thank you. 